The Lizardmen roster is one of the largest and most colourful in the game, with a huge selection of units in all shapes and sizes. Their most iconic units are of course their monsters, which are essentially giant dinosaurs, making them into one of the coolest looking armies in the game. They also have a massive selection of infantry, flyers, casters and more, so it can really build for a lot of playstyles. First, let's go over the pros and cons of the roster overall. First of all, the pros, they have a huge monster selection for pretty much any event or adversary. They also have a super tanky army for the most part, with a lot of infantry and monsters having a lot more armor and HP than units of a similar class and tier. They also have a reasonably large selection of Lords of Magic across their many choices of casting Lords and Heroes. As for the cons, they have a limited selection of ranged infantry, meaning most of their firepower is focused rather than spreading it around an entire army. The early game is also super weak with good units being too expensive and cheap units being pretty aggressively bad. And finally, the large number of large targets makes them quite easy to take down with ranged focus, so keeping them safe can get to be quite a challenge. Just before we get into the roster, a word from the sponsor of today's video, Skillshare. Of course, Skillshare has been sponsoring the channel for quite a while now, so by now you should know all about their thousands of online classes for pretty much any creative skill. Whether you want to learn hands-on photography or videography, or post-production like video editing, VFX and colour grading, Skillshare has a class for you. And there are of course all sorts of other courses, even away from the world of video, that can interest pretty much anyone. One class I've enjoyed this month is Introduction to Lighting by Jordi Vanderput. It covers the basics of lighting when filming a subject and has changed our light scene to create more depth and a more interesting look. This has helped me massively in work, so it's been a huge help. Of course, if this isn't for you, there are thousands more classes online for many different topics with more being added every single week, so there's sure to be something that you'll find interesting. If this all sounds like something that you'd like to be a part of, then click the link in the description where the first 1,000 of you to do so will get one month totally free of Skillshare. Massive thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this week's video. Now, onto the roster. First of all, we have Lords, and first up, we have Lord Mazdamundi. He's a spellcaster and has the cold-blooded ability, which stops Rampage and provides leadership to an allied unit. For the spells, he has a mix of the laws of high and light magic. He's pretty much a pure spellcaster. He can do okay damage versus less armored foes in combat, but his large hitbox makes him vulnerable to range and being surrounded. Keep him at the back and casting, and he'll do alright. Only send him in versus low-risk enemies without much armor or damage of their own. He also has one mount, Zlack. This increases his HP, armor, speed, weapon strength, and charge bonus. Putting him on top of this beast, it means he can now be involved in the front lines combat, as well as being a powerful spellcaster. It also has a short ranged weapon it will constantly fire whilst in combat. Just be careful about the increased size when the enemy has a lot of ranged, as he can be very easy to focus fire, or be cut down with armor piercing and anti-large. Next up we have Krokgar, he's armored, deals armor piercing anti-large damage, has predatory sensors, which means he can see nearby hidden enemy units, and has the cold blooded ability. He's a pretty great front lines fighter with great toughness and damage. Just throw him into the middle of the front lines and he'll do great work versus pretty much anything. He's also a pretty great duelist with that damage and toughness, and even the anti-large if he's versus a mounted or monstrous lord. The only thing he needs to be worried about is getting bogged down by super high armor piercing damage, so just keep him with allies and he should be just fine. He also has three choice of mounts. The cold one, which increases his HP, armor, speed, and charge bonus, and he becomes a slightly large target. You can now use him as a charging lord rather than the sustained combat to make the most of their bonus and speed. Still decent on the front lines, just be careful the increased size doesn't lead to his doom. The horned one gives even more HP, armor, speed, and charge bonus, so it does all the same stuff the cold one does, but only better. And Grimlock gains a ton of armor piercing and weapon damage at the cost of basically every other stat but leadership. It also transforms him into a massive target with a ton of mass that has a huge front lines presence and can take on infantry and monsters with ease with the huge damage. Send him against basically anything and he'll do well. Just be careful of lots of enemy ranged as the large size can make him a lot easier to pick apart. Next we have Tehenoin, he's a spellcaster, has Frenzy, Aquatic and the Focus Instincts ability which stops Rampage and an area around him. He also has access to Law of Beasts. He's quite a jack of all trades with decent armor, high armor piercing and poison damage, as well as the lore of beasts. He can get straight to the front lines versus infantry or other characters, and do pretty well, all while supporting his team with the spellbook. Just don't let him get too deep, as his armor isn't out of this world high, so he'll still go down if he gets caught out. For his mounts, he has a horned one, a ripidactyl, which allows him to fly, so makes him way faster, alongside giving him more HP, weapon strength, and charge bonus. This makes him into a great backlines menace, allowing him to target missiles and artillery with ease, alongside his spells. Just stay on the move to avoid missile fire. And he also has the Engine of the Gods Ancient Stegodon. This makes him into a huge monstrous unit with a ton of HP, armor, and weapon strength, as well as the Engine of the Gods. This provides the Burning Alignment ability, which can obliterate enemies if it fully lands. With this, he's great at pretty much everything. Get him on the front lines, use his spells and abilities, and avoid missiles as much as possible. Tic-Tac-Toe is next. He deals armor piercing damage, has Vanguard deployments, the Drop Sphere of Tepok ability, 20% physical resistance, and the Focus Instincts ability. He's a flying charging lord with that huge charge bonus and weapon strength. You can 
leave him in with those melee stats, but with the low armor and large hitbox, this is a much larger risk than charging in and out. Keep him charging in and out of enemies, focusing on key backlines targets first to get the most value before coming back to charge the front lines and keep your troops encouraged. Next up we have Gorok, he's armored and shielded, deals armor piercing damage, is a melee expert, has predatory sensors, expert charge defense, and the cold blooded ability. He's an unbelievably powerful frontlines lord. He's supremely tanky with massive armor, a silver shield and 60 defense. He also deals amazing damage with the brilliant weapon strength and high melee attack. Throw him into the front lines versus pretty much anything and he'll come out on top. As long as he isn't totally surrounded by high armor piercing damage, he should do great. Nakai the Wanderer is armored, deals armor piercing damage, is aquatic, has predatory sensors and the cold blooded ability. Where Gorok is the frontlines tank, Nakai is the frontlines berserker with outstanding damage and a huge attack stat. He's still tanky with massive armor, but larger hitbox and low defense, resulting in him taking a lot more hits over the course of battle, as well as being more vulnerable to ranged. You want to charge him into the front lines, take on large groups of enemies with this high damage and area attacks, and pull him out once things start to heat up to avoid him taking too much damage. He can duel, but with his area damage, it is a little bit of a waste of his talents. Whatever he's fighting, just keep an eye out for ranged and high damage surrounding him, and he should do great work. Oxethel has scaling damage, which means he deals more damage based on how much HP the target has lost. Stalk, Chameleon, he built as a fire whilst moving, and the Cold Blood ability. Oxy is the ranged combat specialist of the legendary lords. His primary damage output is from range with high armor piercing poison and magical damage, making anything he hits feel a ton of pain no matter what defenses they have. His range and speed make him best at skirmishing, but just be careful of fast units catching him out of position. He's also okay in the front lines, but has low armor and armor piercing melee damage, so unless he's out of ammo, he should avoid it if at all possible. Just keep him on the move and shooting key targets, and he'll do great. First of our generic lords are the Slan Mage Priests. These are spellcasters and have the cold blooded ability. These can come with a lot of fire, heavens, high magic, life, or light. These guys are more or less the exact same as Mazda Mundi, give or take a few minor stat differences, but you can still use them pretty much the same. Focus on spell casting and stay near your troops to keep them encouraged, and only send them in versus low threat troops to get some safe damage in. Next we have the Croxcore Ancients. These are armored, deal armor piercing anti-infantry damage, have predatory sensors, and the cold blooded ability. These are very similar to Nakai, but weaker in their melee and damage stats, so will overall be a little worse in most areas. You can still use them pretty much the same, but just execute a lot more caution to ensure they don't get taken down from melee or from a range. Other than that, send them in to wreak havoc on the front lines with that glorious area damage. The Red Crested Skink Chiefs deal armor piercing anti-large damage, have poison attacks, are aquatic, and have the Focus Instincts ability. These guys are a bit of a weird one since their damage is pretty good with decent melee stats and weapon strength, but their armor is pretty low, so anything with decent damage is going to be dangerous for them to fight. Try to focus on low damage foes with high armor to get the most value and avoid letting them get surrounded at all costs as their mid armor will not keep them safe for long. They also have three mounts, the Horned One, the Ripodactyl, and the Ancient Stegodon, which makes them into a giant monster with a ton of HP, armor, and weapon strength alongside a nice bit of rapid fire missile strength. Have them fire upon enemies before getting involved in melee where needed, just watch out for missiles as their large size makes them an easy target. And our final lords are these Saurus Old Bloods. These are armored and shielded, have armor piercing damage, predatory instincts, and the cold blooded ability. These are pretty much the weaker Krokgar with worse attack but slightly improved defense with an added shield and some extra defense to make up for less attack, damage and no bonus versus large. This makes them into great tanks that can get involved in the front lines versus pretty much anything and do good work without taking too many hits. They still have good damage so will do well versus armor and even in jewels so use them more or less the same. Just avoid getting them pinned down in the middle of high armor piercing damage and they should do just fine. They also have two mounts, the cold one and the Carnosaur, which is basically the same as Krokgar's Grimlock, just a little weaker in most stats. Coming to the heroes now, we have the one and only legendary hero, Lord Croak. He's a spellcaster, unbreakable, and has the cold blooded ability. And he has access to the deliverance of its spells. Very similar to the Slan Mage Priest, but with a couple of differences, mainly the unbreakable leadership and very poor defense. His spells are of course his real power, with his unique deliverance of its line, offering some of the most powerful magic in the game, so keep him casting as often as possible to blow enemies away in seconds and rack him up a ton of kills. With his defense, I would avoid pretty much all combat if possible, but if he ends up fighting, he'll at least do some good damage before he goes down. Next up we have the Sora Scar Veteran, these armored and shielded, and deal armor piercing anti-large damage. They have predatory instincts and the cold blooded ability. These are like the old bloods, but worse, making them a worse, worse version of Krokgar. They function more or less the same with worse stats across the board, meaning they deal less and take more damage. Still, toss them into the front line to get some value. Now, just be extra careful not to let them get surrounded as they'll go down even quicker if they do. They also have two mounts. The Cold One and the Carnosaur. Skink Chiefs have Poison Attacks, Aquatic, can fire whilst on the move, and have the Cold Blooded ability. These are quite similar to Oxyotl, but worse in every stat. The best use for damage is from a range with their high, albeit not overly armor piercing poison damage. Keep them on skirmish and flanking enemies to fire on key targets. Be careful of faster enemies catching them out, and avoid melee if you can, as their stats are poor, as well as armor, so they'll go down very quickly. 
We also have three mounts. The Pterodon, which makes him into a flying missile specialist with a ton of speed. Still, not a frontline beastie, so keep him on the move and firing to avoid missiles and deal some decent damage. The Stegodon, which changes him into a huge monstrous artillery piece with a ton of power in melee and from a range. You can sit him at the back and fire or get him into the front lines. Whatever you do, just avoid letting them get focused from melee or range, as large size makes them easy to concentrate on, or the ancient Stegodon. Next up, we have the Skink Oracles. These are spellcasters, deal armor piercing damage, cause terror, have poison attacks, and the cold blooded ability. Their spells they have a mixed spell book from a range of different laws. Even without their spells, these are great heroes. They have excellent damage from a range and in melee, but range is a lot higher and safer with a ton of armor piercing, anti large bonus, and poison. Keep them back and have them fire in key targets to make the most of their high damage missiles. Send them in once they run out of ammo, but keep them safe from being surrounded, as even with their high armor, they can go down fast. With their spells, they can provide a versatile support in battle, so keep them shooting and in casting range, and they'll get loads of value. And finally, with the Skink Priests. These are spellcasters and aquatic, and they can come with the Lore of Beasts or the Lore of Heavens. These guys are purely spellcasters. Keep them out of combat or costs and casting to get any value at all. If they get into combat with anything melee or ranged, they'll go down fast with terrible melee stats and armor, so avoid it at all times. They also come with four mounts. The Pterodon, the Stegodon, the Ancient Stegodon, and the Engine of the Gods, Ancient Stegodon. Now we finally come to the melee infantry. First up, we have the Skink Cohort. These are a tier one unit, a shielded and aquatic. These are a super basic chaff front line. They have poor melee stats and armor with passable weapon strength for this stage of the game. Use them to bog down the enemy, and then bring in monsters, missiles, and magic to do the real damage. The only real strength is their speed, so use this to surround enemies and make up for their poor combat skills. The Red Crested Skinks are a tier 1 unit, deal armor piercing damage, have frenzy, poison attacks, and aquatic. These are a reasonable step up in damage from the cohort with improved weapon strength and poison damage, but somehow even more squishy. They have no shields, low armor, and very low defense, so the most basic enemy force will hit them very hard and they will not survive for long. Keep them well supported so you can take out enemies before they take too many hits. Take a mix of front lines, as these being your only choice will result in a very fragile front line and a very vulnerable back line. Next up, the Chameleon Stalkers. These are a tier 3 unit somehow, have a low ammo missile weapon, vanguard deployments, chameleon, which means they can move hidden through any terrain and have missile resist, as well as dodge, which is physical resistance. These are a purely flanking front lines unit. Their speed and stealth lets them get around and behind enemies to attack from an unexpected location. Their ranged weapons shoot explosive shots that disrupt enemies, as well as dealing some decent damage to make the following melee combat a lot easier. They still aren't the best combatants in the world, but their flank combined with their ranged and following poison damage will allow them to take down enemies before they really know what's hit them. They're decently tough with OK armor and some resistance, but for sure, don't think that they are tanky. Use them alongside the real front lines rather than as your only option. Next we have the Soros Warriors. These are a tier 2 unit, have predatory sensors, and the Primal Instincts ability. These are the first real front line of the Lizards. They have great HP, much better armor, as well as much higher weapon strength. Melee stats still aren't amazing, but what can you expect from an early game unit? Use them as your mid game wall to keep enemies still and provide them with as much support as possible to deal all the real damage to tougher foes. They're also quite slow, so against fast enemies, you'll need to position correctly to keep your army safe. We also have Sora Spears. These are a tier two unit, have anti-large damage, charge defense versus large, predatory sensors, and primal instincts. These are pretty similar to the warriors, but have less attack and damage for more defense, a bonus versus large, and charge defense. This makes them a little sturdier against most forms of damage, so we'll hold the line that a little bit longer. Use them more or less the same, and provide them with lots of support to deal all the damage. Now, just enjoy them staying a little bit longer. The Saurus Warriors and the Saurus Spears also come with some variations. Just gain shielded. Pretty much the exact same as the regular units, but gain more defense and a shield. You can use them pretty much the same, and they'll be tougher from a range and in melee. Simple as that. And our final melee infantry unit is the Temple Guard. These are a tier 3 units, armored and shielded, deal armor piercing damage, have charge defense versus large, and predatory sensors. These gain armor, leadership, attack, and armor piercing damage over the shielded spears, making them a threat as well as even tankier. Their improved damage means most forces that come against them will feel the pain even without support. Adding support to them makes your front lines super deadly, so do this to wipe enemies as fast as possible. Honestly, just use them the exact same, but now enjoy them being tankier and deadlier. The only thing they have to worry about is super high armor piercing damage, so keep an eye out for this and they'll be just fine. Now we come to the ranged infantry. First up, we have the Javelin Skin Cohort. These are a tier 1 unit, are shielded, have poison attacks, and are aquatic. These are the exact same as the regular cohort from the melee infantry, but now have low ammo ranged weapons. You may as well use these over the base unit since the minor cost gets you a lot of utility and early damage. Get them an angle to fire either on a flank or just before the lines clash, and give everything they've got. 
months are out of ammo, they're still the same units as before, so the same advice applies. Just make sure to use their ammo before sending them into melee to get the most value. Next up, we have the Skink Skirmishers. These are a tier 1 unit, have Vanguard deployment, poison attacks, aquatic, and can fire whilst moving. These are a more focused ranged unit, dropping the shield and melee stats in favour of a lot more ammo and the ability to skirmish. Keep them on the move and flanking enemies to fire into the backs of the front lines. Their damage isn't amazing, so instead focus on spreading the poison damage to as many units as possible to debuff enemy troops. Do this and keep them safe from being caught out by fast units, and they'll be doing great work for you. Just avoid melee at all costs, as their stats are truly awful. And finally, we have the Chameleon Stalkers. These are a tier 2 unit, have Vanguard Deployment, Chameleon, Aquatic, and can fire whilst moving. These are very similar to the Skink Skirmishers, since they have the same speed and will be used more or less the same to flank and spread their damage around. They get an increase to almost every stat, but when you lock them, it hardly changes how they'll be used. The addition of stock makes it a lot easier for them to get into position, just make sure they don't expose themselves too early and get caught out before they can get any value. Still, spread the damage around and avoid melee at all costs, and they should do just fine. Now come to the calf. First up we have Feral Cold Ones, these are a tier 1 unit, armoured, deal armour piercing damage, and have Rampage. And don't you know it. These won the worst unit in the faction award, and it's not really hard to see why. On paper, they don't seem too bad, and they can work well as flankers to take down ranged troops in the early game when you have no other choices. The problem is their rampage, and it seems like they go on one at the drop of a hat and normally end up dying because of it. Use their speed to keep them out of ranged and melee trouble and focus on super weak enemy back lines. Avoid combat with any real melee units, and they might just stay in control if you're very lucky. Next we have Cold One Riders, these are a tier 2 units, are armored and shielded, deal armor piercing damage, have predatory sensors, and primal instincts. These are a little slower than the Feral Cold Ones, but a major step up in every other category. They have more armor, leadership, melee stats, and damage, but most importantly, they have no rampage. You can still use them pretty much the same to flank and take out enemy backlines, just now you don't have to worry about them going out of control. Either their charge bonus nor their melee stats are amazing, so use a combination of both to get the job done and avoid them taking as much damage as possible. Do not let them get pinned down and stuck in combat, as their large size will result in a swift death versus anything halfway decent. They also come in another variation, Cold One Spear Riders. These are the exact same as the regular riders, but lose some attack and overall weapon strength to gain a bonus versus large. You want to use these guys to go after large targets like monsters or the cav, still using a combo of charging and melee to optimize their damage and reduce their hits taken. If you're going after infantry, then stick to the base units, but if you want to take out large, these are the choice to go. The Ripidactyl Riders are a tier 3 units, have armor piercing anti-infantry damage, vanguard deployments, and frenzy. These are a great charging flying cav, with pretty good charge bonus and a strong weapon strength and even decent attack. Sadly, they lack defense and armor, so sustained combat against anything with any sort of damage is off the table. Use their high speed to get around the backs and sides of the enemies and target vulnerable units in the back lines. Once there are no more back lines, turn their attention to the front lines, just be sure to cycle charge as quickly as possible to keep them safe. And finally, we have the Horned Ones. These are a tier 3 units, armoured and shielded, deal armour piercing damage, have predatory sensors and primal instincts. These are a direct upgrade to the Cold One Riders, with improvements to basically every stat. They're faster, tougher, deal more damage both from charging and sustained combat, though charge is where they should be used most. Use their speed to get around enemy front lines and take out their ranged units and artillery before coming back to cycle charge the front lines. Keep them on the move and out of combat with anything even halfway decent as their large size and low defense will spell a quick death if they cannot escape combat. Now we come to by far the largest category, the monsters and beasts. First up we have the Feral Bastilodon, this is a tier 2 unit, armored, deals armor piercing melee damage and has rampage. Pretty much does what it says in the tin, it's a feral tanky beast that deals great damage in large feral area attacks. Charge into enemy forces alongside your front lines to keep it surrounded and watch it go to town. It deals great armor piercing damage so no enemy is too tough. It also is surprisingly tanky with a huge armor stats even alongside the low defense. It's still prone to going on a rampage so just make sure it's deep in the enemy units if it does so it deals as much damage as possible and of course support it with melee infantry to try and keep it alive. Also be aware of ranged focus as their large size makes them an easy target. Be aware of this and anti-large or armor piercing melee and they should do great. The Revive Crystal Bastilodon, because I'm really sick of trying to say that word, is a tier 3 unit. It has the Revive Crystal which can be used to heal units and resurrect dead entities. It's armored deals armor piercing melee and causes terror. This is the exact same as the Feral Bastilodon with some improvements. They can no longer rampage, which is great. They also have a team of ranged troops on their backs, which fight constantly in combat to get their damage numbers up. And of course, they have the Revive Crystal, so can heal allied units in combat, so work great as support monsters. Still, use them to charge into the front lines and now enjoy even more damage alongside the ability to heal allies when needed. Try and keep them central to your army to make the most of this ability wherever it is needed. You also have the Ark of Sotek Bastilodon. This is a tier 3 unit, is armored, deals armor piercing damage, causes terror, has poison attacks, and of course has the Ark of Sotek, which applies Sotek poison to all nearby enemy units. It's pretty much the same as the Revive Crystal, but swaps that for the Ark of Sotek. This allows them to deal poison damage to nearby enemy units, so just charge into a big clump of foes and let loose the extra damage. Use them the same other than this, and they'll do great work for you. Next up we have the Croc Score. These are a tier 3 units, have armor piercing damage, predatory sensors, and primal instincts. 
These are a great frontline support monster. Charge them in with your melee infantry to keep them protected, and watch them deal great area damage with their great armor piercing, especially alongside the bonus visit infantry. Just don't let them get in too deep, as they can still go down fast when focused due to their low defense. If you keep them safe, they'll slaughter most infantry you put in front of them. Just make sure they aren't slow to keep the odds in their favor. You also have the Sacred Croc scores. These are a tier 3 units, are armored, have armor piercing damage, predatory sensors, and primal instincts. Pretty similar to the regular Croc scores, but gain more attack, magical damage, and a nice increase to their weapon strength. This makes them better at the exact same job, so use them the exact same, and they'll do great work. Now they'll be deadly to resistance as well as armor, so pretty much anything will go down if you send these guys in. Keep them well supported to avoid unnecessary damage, and they'll do just fine. Next we have the Feral Carnosaur. This is a tier 3 unit, is armored, has armor piercing anti large damage, and has a rampage. It's a giant T-Rex. What more is there to say? It's a monster on the front lines and can tear entire clumps to shreds with a huge damage and large area attacks. It also has that bonus versus large, so duels versus other large monsters work excellently. No matter what it's doing, keep it well supported with melee infantry and other units to keep it alive and confident. Avoid missile fire and getting stuck in the middle of high damage, as it can quickly go down, especially if a rampage is triggered. With a high speed, it can target pretty much anything, just make sure you use that speed to keep it safe and alive. Next, we have the Quattle. This is a tier 3 unit. It's a spellcaster with two bound spells, has the Master of the Sacred Places ability, and Scaly Skin, which is Missile Resist. This is a super weird unit with a lot of abilities, but also a lot of fun to use. You can use the Master of Sacred Places ability to hide basically your entire army if you position them right and swarm the enemy before they know what hit them. You can use their spells to wreak havoc pretty much any way you choose. Their high speed lets them get across the map at a rapid pace and not much can outrun and slow them down. I would use them to take down back lines as they're pretty hard to stop without the enemy having flies of their own. Just keep them safe from range as they can quickly fall if focused. Once back lines are clear, bring it into the front lines, making sure to keep friendly troops nearby. It deals great magical armor piercing damage, but can go down pretty easily with a large hitbox and low defense and armor. Keep it safe from being focused and use those spells on cooldown and it should bring you a lot of value with all the combat and abilities. Next up we have the Feral Stegodon. These are tier three units, are armored, deal armor piercing damage, cause terror, and can go on a rampage. This is a pretty direct upgrade from the Bastildodon as it's still pretty tanky and deals a ton of front lines damage. Use it basically the same to support your melee infantry and charge into clumps of enemy infantry to make the most of large area, armor piercing and anti-infantry damage. Of course it can go on a rampage, so just try and keep it as safe as possible while fighting. And if something does happen, just pray it goes into something it can finish off. No more to it than that. Pretty simple, charge and fight monster. You also have the Engine of the Gods Ancient Stegodon. This is a tier 3 unit, is armored, deals armor piercing damage, causes terror, and has poison attacks. This is a massive upgrade despite the slightly lower attack stat. They gain increases to armor, leadership, and weapon strength on top of the new ranged weapons team, meaning their damage will be massive throughout the entire battle. On top of this, they gain the Engine of the Gods Burning Alignment ability to scorch the earth and wipe whole armies out if you place it correctly. Just make sure you aim it at the enemy and not your own troops, otherwise it can just as easily wipe your army out. Send them into the middle of the front lines to keep them central and use the ability on the biggest clumps you can find on cooldown for a ton of damage and value. The Feral Dread Soarin is next. It's a tier 3 unit, is armored, deals armor piercing damage, causes terror, and can go on a rampage. These are truly giant beasts, like the size of an entire unit of infantry. So of course, come with a lot of power and one huge drawback. First of all, their pattern. They have a ton of HP, armor, and of course damage and can slaughter infantry en masse. If you send them into a clump, it doesn't matter how much armor they have, they're gonna get eaten alive by these guys. Sadly, their massive size does make them an easy target for ranged and being surrounded in melee. The low defense means that high damage anti-large foes will slaughter them when they get locked into combat, alongside enemy range basically having a guaranteed hit. Add on the rampage and they can quickly spiral to their doom once the heat is on. Send them into the front lines clumps, but keep them supported with melee infantry and other units to take down ranged threats and keep them alive and fighting. It also comes in another variation, and our final monster unit, the Dread Soarin. It's a tier 3 unit, is armored, deals armor piercing damage, causes terror, and can fire whilst moving. It's pretty much the basic unit, but gains a ton of improvements with more leadership, no rampage, and a missile team on its back that will deal a ton of damage over the course of the battle. Pretty much the same, but now enjoy no rampage and a bunch more damage from the ranged. It's still a beast and will destroy melee clumps, just get rid of ranged units to make sure it survives. And now we come to our final category, the missile monsters and beasts. First up we have Pterodon Riders, these are a tier 2 units, and with Vanguard deployment, poison attacks, can fire whilst moving, and have the death from above drop rocks ability. These work great as flanking skirmish units since nothing can really stop them getting around enemies other than other flyers or a lot of ranged. Move them behind enemies to fire into the backs of the front lines and make sure you use their drop rocks for some added burst. 
Be careful of letting them get caught in melee combat or focus them at range, as their low armor and HP can spell a quick death. Take out enemy ranged or keep them at a safe distance, and they should do pretty great. They also come with another variation, the Fire Leech Bowlers. These are the exact same unit, but swap the poison and a little bit of ammo for flaming missiles. This makes them better versus units more vulnerable to fire, such as undead, as well as giving them a light bit of explosive damage. If you're up against a lot of these, then go for these guys. If not, then the base unit with the poison will do great. Next we have the Raised On Hunting Pack. These are a tier two units, armored, deal armor piercing damage, aquatic and have primal instincts. These are a great flanking missile unit with their high speed and decent range. They can get around enemies and into position, then rain high armor piercing damage onto them from a safe distance. They also have armor piercing melee, but their low stats make them pretty poor, both damage and survivability wise. Keep them firing until they're out of ammo and send them in versus very weak enemies to ensure they survive whatever combat they get into. Next up, we have the Salamander Hunting Pack. These are a tier two units, have armor piercing damage, aquatic and primal instincts. These are very similar to the raised ones, but gain flaming missiles and melee damage at the cost of some armor piercing. They also gain anti-large on their missiles, so do well versus large targets as well as clumps with their explosive fire attacks. Use them pretty much the same and they'll do good or better depending on what you put them up against. The explosive does make up quite a lot for the lack of armor piercing, so don't worry about it too much. Next we have the Ancient Salamander. These are a tier 3 units, are armored, deal armor piercing damage, cause terror, have primal instincts and flame imbued attacks. This is basically a larger single salamander and has stats like one. It's better in most stats, but obviously HP, and will do the same job but have a lot more focus damage due to them only having one missile at a time. Use its massive armor piercing damage to focus down key targets on the enemy side. Keep it out of melee if you can. The stats are better, but it's still not great. Best to keep it safe and use up all the ammo before thinking about the front lines. The Solar Engine Bastilodon is next. This is a tier 3 unit, is armored, deals armor piercing melee damage, causes terror, and has the beam of Chotek, which is magical, flaming, and blind infused missiles. This is similar to the other Bastilodons in the sense it's a tank with a ton of armor piercing and melee damage, but drops some stats and picks up a solar cannon. This grants it a ton of range damage over a massive distance. This makes it into a great artillery piece that can stand at the back and deal massive damage and defend itself pretty good if it gets caught out. Of course, keep it firing as much as you can and avoid melee unless it's out of ammo or unavoidable to get the most value possible. Large targets are a great choice to get all the damage from the missile into a HP bar, but the explosive shots can do well versus infantry clumps if you get a good angle. So experiment to find out what's working best in that specific battle. The damage isn't massively armor piercing, but with raw numbers like this, most targets will feel the pain regardless. Next up we have the Stegodon. These are tier three units, are armored, deal armor piercing damage, cause terror, and have poison attacks. Again, similar to the Feral Stegodon, which is a tanky dino with a ton of melee damage, but now it picks up a high powered ballista capable of dealing damage from the entire map away. The damage is poison and armor piercing, so pretty much everything is going to feel the hurt. Use it to target larger single entities to make the most of that high damage and small explosive impact. Of course it can defend itself if caught in combat, but avoid this whenever possible as the ranged damage is so much safer, so use up all your ammo before engaging in melee. Also avoid being focused by enemy ranged as they are massive targets so can go down fast if concentrated on. We also have the Ancient Stegodon, this is a tier 3 unit, is armored, deals armor piercing melee damage, causes terror and can fire whilst moving. This is a bit of a weird move from the Stegodon since it has more armor but less attack. The range damage is also much shorter range and less armor piercing focused with short range rapid fire high damage. They work best right in the front lines as they continue firing even in melee so the rapid fire will be spread out to all units around them to wipe out infantry with ease. They can still focus fire into large targets if needed but can do it all so really don't need to worry about aiming too hard. Just send them into the front lines and they'll deal tons of damage with ranged and melee. Just don't let them get surrounded by anti-larger armor piercing or focus from a range and they should do great. And our final unit in this gargantuan roster is the Feral Troglodon. This is a tier 3 unit, deals armor piercing damage, causes terror, and has poison attacks, and rampage. These are more or less the skink oracles, but with no oracle. This means no spells and slightly worse leadership alongside the unfortunate rampage. Use them the same to get into the flanks and deal damage to key targets from a range before moving in to do the same in melee once they run out of ammo. Be extra careful where you send them in melee, as the rampage can quickly spell doom if they choose the wrong targets. Also be aware of ranged as they're still large targets, so you don't want to get picked apart or send the rampage because they get shot at. Now we come to the regiments for now, I'll call out each unit, what it's the unit of, and the differences between it and the base unit. The cohort of Sotek are a red crested skinx unit and gain improved leadership, less attack, refuse to die ability, and unbreakable. The Legion of Chakwa are a shielded Sora Spears unit and gain armor and the shield of chakra ability. The Star Chamber Guardians are a Temple Guard unit and gain magical attacks and the Guardian ability. The Pop Hope Art Cohort are a Cold One Spear Riders unit and gain Vanguard deployment and immune to psychology. The Colossodon Hunters are Ripidactyl Rider units and gain the Toad Rage ability. The Cohort of Huatl are Sacred Croc Scores and gain armor sundering attacks and swap physical for missile resistance. Gelt Blom's Terror is a Feral Carnosaur and loses one melee attack on the Rampage but gains Strider, Vanguard deployment and can hide in forests. Spirit of Tepok is a Coatl and swaps the Bound spells for Lesser Shield of Thorns and Lesser Banishments. The Shredder of Lustria is a Dread Sorin and gains Encourage and the Dread Aversion ability. 
Pahoac Sentinels are Pterodon Riders and swap Drop Rocks for Drop Rocks of Sundering and gain Physical Resistance. Barbs are a Razor on Hunting Pack and gain Poison Damage and Missile Resistance. Umbral Tide are a Salamander Hunting Pack and gain Perfect Vigor. The Pale Death is a Feral Troglodon and gains the Primeval Roar ability. And the Thunderous One is an Ancient Stegodon which gains the Judgment of Uxmak ability. And finally, we also have the Blessed Spawnings. Lizardmen have access to Blessed Spawnings through missions during the campaign, which are improved versions of based units. Less Skink Skirmishers gain HP and Spell Resistance. Less Chameleon Skinks gain HP, Charge, Bonus and Ammo. Less Fire Leech Bowler Pterodon Riders gain HP and Speed. Less Shielded Saurus Warriors gain HP and Perfect Vigor. Less Shielded Saurus Spears gain HP, Forest Rider, which grants bonuses when fighting in a forest. Crox Gores gain HP and Charge Bonus. Blessed Cold One Spear Riders gain HP and Speed. Blessed Soul Engine Bastilodons gain HP and Perfect Vigor. Blessed Temple Guard gain HP and Charge Bonus. Blessed Stegodons gain HP and Perfect Vigor, but loses a Missile Resist. Blessed Horned Ones gain HP, but lose Primal Instincts and the Blessed Carnosaur gains HP, Speed, and Spell Resistance. And finally, we come to the army compositions. In Warhammer 3, every unit has a tier from 1 to 3, and I'm going to be using these tiers to make you armies for the early, mid, and late game, so that you are set for every single step of your campaign. First of all, tier 1, we're going to start with a Slan Mage Priest of Fire, 8 Red Crested Skinks, 8 Javelin Skink Cohorts, and 3 Feral Cold Ones. The Mage of Fire will be great in the early game, once even a single spell comes online, and the law will scale just fine into the late game, as long as you have a bit of good placement and luck. The Red Crested Skinks are super fragile, but so is the entire army, so we didn't have a lot to work with. They'll do high damage in their short lives, so make the most of them while you can to get good value. The Javelin's going to support the Skinks with even more damage before moving into sandwich enemy lines once you're out of ammo, or target enemy ranged if they can get to them fast enough. Finally, the Cold Ones are the only choice we have for something to flank and take on the back lines, so we're going to have to take them. Use their high speed to get around and into the back lines, and just pray they don't get hurt too bad or go to Rampage. At tier 2, still got that Slam Mage Priest of Fire, now picking up a Sora Scar Veteran, 6 Shielded Sora Spears, 4 Salamander Hunting packs, 2 Cold One Riders, 4 Feral Bastilodons, and 2 Pterodon Riders. The Mage should have all their spells online by now, so he'll be providing spell spots where needed in the form of damage and buffs. The Scar Veteran will provide that encouragement on the front lines and do some work tanking and killing enemy infantry. The Shielded Spears are a great unit that will keep most enemies at bay for a very long time, so work great in their role right up into the late game if needed. The Salamanders will provide a ton of firepower with their explosive shots. Whether you need to take out a single target or a clump of infantry, they'll do great. The Cold One Riders will replace the Feral Cold Ones and be on the flanks taking out enemy ranged troops wherever needed before coming back to charge the front lines. The Feral Bastilodons are there to be let loose into the enemy front lines and deal as much damage as possible while they're there. And finally, the Pterodon Riders will provide some ranged support and spread poison damage onto as much of the enemy force as they possibly can. And finally, we come to tier 3. Still being led by that Slan Mage Priest of Fire, still got our Sora Scar Veteran, now picking up a Skink Oracle. We're going to have 6 Temple Guard, 2 Sacred Croxagores, 2 Feral Carnosaurs, 2 Engine of the Gods Ancient Stegodons, 2 Stegodons, 1 Dread Saurin, 2 Ripidactyls, and a Partridge in a Pear Tree. The Scar Veteran should be in their final form on a Carnosaur mount, so be a terror anywhere he's needed with great speed and excellent damage. The Skink Oracle will provide more spell support, alongside some great melee and range damage from the Troglodon mount. The Temple Guard are the endgame front lines with great toughness and damage, so will do great versus anything. The Sacred Croxagores, Dread Soarin, and Engine of the Gods Stegodons will do great on the front lines alongside the infantry and deal great damage with their weapons and abilities. The Carnosaurs will work with the Scar Veteran to flank or focus down large targets, whichever is more pressing. The Ripidactyl Riders will flank around to take out ranged troops to keep your army safe and the Stegodons will sit at the back and shoot stuff before coming back into combat if needed. And that is everything you need to know on how to play the Lizardmen in battle. We've got the Tomb King campaign guide coming next, so subscribe if you want to see that. We are hoping to hit 50k subscribers by the end of the year, so I sure would appreciate the assistance. If you enjoyed this video and or found it useful, then consider dropping a like. If you really enjoy the content and want to support it directly, then consider becoming a member on YouTube or a Patreon on the Patreon. Doing so gets you early insights into future content, increased voting power, discounts on merch, as well as shoutouts at the end videos like Henry took off his spot at the officer's tier. Thank you to all supporters, one last thank you for watching, and for now, I've been Colonel Danders, and I will see you next turn.